We're going to read from um, the book of Joshua, and chapter 5 into chapter 6. Um, it's not a long reading, it's a sh- quite a short reading. We, we're going to begin uh, reading at verse 11, I think, of chapter 5, and it's just down to the end of verse 7, so, uh, 5, sorry, of chapter 6. <coughs> So it's Joshua chapter 5 and verse 11. Now, um, the children of Israel have come into the promised land. Um, The Lord has done a tremendous miracle by holding back the waters of the Jordan in flood time (coughs) and recorded other things as well where we see (coughs) this happening. And uh, the first verse says about them, And they ate of the produce of the land after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? He said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Now now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, All you men of war, you shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. So, <coughs> I've been reading a, a, a book lately. Uh, it's called, the title of the book is That God Never Gives Up on You. Now this has got absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, this came out over the last couple of weeks. Uh, This applies to me, and I hope it applies to you as well, Um, what we have here with Joshua. Let me start by saying this, or asking this. Have you ever faced something in your life, as you looked at it, it was just too big for you? Might be facing it now. There are things happening in our lives uh, that we would probably never have invited in to happen. Events happen. But in they came. In they came. And you stand there looking at the problem and it just towers over you. And you just say to yourself, I can't do this. It's just too big. Just like the walls of Jericho here as Joshua must have looked at them and thought, how am I going to get over this? How am I going to get around this? Because it was a huge problem. It was a huge, and it must, must have been troubling him as they were starting to make their journey, and they were going to, there was going to be many, many battles and many fights. Just because the Lord had brought them into the land of Canaan didn't mean from that moment on Everything was on cotton wool. The people would, would, would just stand back and let them take anything that they wanted. There were many, many battles that were going to be fought 
inside Canaan, the promised land. So have you ever been there, or are you there now? Well, let's have a look at Joshua. See how uh, what it uh, tells us about his problem, Jericho, and see what it teaches us about our problems, our Jerichos that stand there as if they can't be moved. Now I'll start with a story about a person. We got there's two stories. I'll start them and we'll finish them right at right at the end. But they're true stories. They are true stories. First one is about a lady called Joy Vernon. And Joy Vo Vernon is, because she's still alive, is a member of the Oak Hills Church in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, quite a big church. Now, they were, she was going on holidays with her husband and with her children and her parents, her mother and father were going as well. They were going to Colorado and they had hired um, a, a large SUV car to fit them all in. You remember a big one like that, Ma, when you, when we went over to America and it was like a, like a small bus. Really. You could get every, everything in. So they hired this. They were on the side of a mountain. They were enjoying the views that there are in, in Colorado. And out of the corner of her eye, Joy could see, the car was empty, but she could see the car moving. And so her husband had gone over quite a distance away, taking photographs, and her mother was with him, and the father was somewhere in between. She ran to the car and went in front of the car to try to stop it, which it was happening, but she was being literally pushed, you can imagine, in the gravel, just being pushed back by this heavy vehicle. Her father ran around as, as fast as he possibly could to get into the car, into the driver's seat so that he could pull the handbrake up or whatever, or the push foot brake it is out there actually, the handbrake, to get in there to stop it. But in this process, while he was getting over there, she had gone under the vehicle and the vehicle had gone over her and her father then was able to stop, stop the vehicle. Now then, um, she was unconscious and she had to be airlifted from there to the hospital and the scans uh, showed she was uh, still unconscious. The scan showed that she had broken her back and she had severe internal injuries. Very, very severe. Um, they Basically, it says that they gave very little hope of her ever walking again. And if, that is, if she survived at all. And she had two children. One was six and one was four. Uh, she was in an induced coma for 10 days and when she uh, finally was brought out of the coma the doctors had to break the news to her about her situation, about the prognosis and she says <coughs> herself that she said I gave up all hope I just gave up hope and she said I didn't say it to my family but inside I begged God to take my life. She was facing her Jericho. The parents had, had already gone in touch with the church days before to ask the church, please, will you pray, will you pray? Other fellowships and other assemblies were also uh, praying for her. Now we'll come back to her <coughs> at the end of the story. There's another one which I believe I've shared with you before. Um, the, the lady was a member. I think she's not sure if she's still alive. Um, but I'll say, say she is alive. She's a member of a church. You've heard of Charles Stanley? Yeah. Yeah. Who's gone home to be with the Lord. Yeah. But uh, she's a member of that church. Um, she was very, very, very involved with the Sunday school. And um, one day she was diagnosed with a very, very aggressive cancer. Very little hope was given for her. And she was taken into hospital where it was intense uh, chemotherapy and um, nothing seemed to be working. And so they basically said, you know, to her husband after a few weeks, you can take, her, take your wife home. Uh, we will bring everything that's needed in the home like end-of-life 
support and everything that you need would be in the home. And she was in her home with all the tubes going into her with the chemotherapy and the pain relief for her to end her life. At home, she was facing the Jericho. And we'll see what happens with her at the end. Now, I'm sure Joshua would want to weigh in with her on these stories because uh, as well as these accounts, where he wasn't in hospital. Neither was he in a bed in, in, in home with, with tubes going in him. But as he looked at these walls and as he looked at this city, I could imagine his heart and his thoughts were, how on earth, how on earth are we going to get around this? How on earth are we going to get past this? He didn't know how he was going to go forward with it because it was such a huge thing. And yet, when, you know, he didn't have the benefit of looking back so far in scripture, in history. I mean, we have this benefit now. If, if this was like, you know, in the New Testament, they would have had the benefit of looking back through the Old Testament. But we can look back and we can say, well, well David had his Goliath. That's a, I would like to stand in, in front of a man who's, that's the height of Goliath there, the oranges. Can you imagine that? That's the height of the fella. And David's a little shepherd boy. And so you can imagine facing this man who's, who's covered in armour. He's got a sword and a shield and a, and a spear. Huge spear. How is he going to face this? I mean, Elijah. Elijah had his Jezebel. That was, that was his Jericho, in a sense. Facing this woman who did everything in her power. To get Elijah killed. She tried everything. But she failed. John the Baptist. He, would, he had the. He, his Jericho was probably the Roman Empire. And some of the Pharisees. That were, were standing against John the Baptist. And Joshua. Joshua here. Right at the outset. He had this uh, city of barbaric people. This highly fortified city. The scripture tells us that it, it, you know, it towered on the barren plains north of the Dead Sea. Remember the, the song? We know the songs, don't we? Round the walls of Jericho. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a description of the walls. The bottom wall was 17 feet thick. Okay. Now take into consideration that's 9 foot. Flop that down. Okay, down here, you're nearly the width of what we have here. Okay, so you could drive two cars down here easy, couldn't you? Yeah. Easy. Yeah. In fact, we've got more room down here to drive two cars than what we've got on the road. <laughs> that was the base wall. It was 17 feet thick. It was 16 feet high. <coughs> That's nine foot. That's the base wall. The next wall on top of it was eight foot thick. And that stood... 22 feet high. 22 feet. Now, then let's, let, me, let me work this out for you, okay? 22 feet will take you way up past the top of your bedroom window. Right? And that's the second wall. So under that is a wall 16 feet. So you can imagine looking at this and, and wondering how are we going to get over this a foreboding task isn't it just to just to look at it and as, as the as the lord said to them as they were going into the promised land you have not passed this way before and they had definitely not passed this before in all their wandering through the wilderness this was the biggest place that they had seen since they've been in the wilderness but isn't it strange we're all, we're all the same really we tend to forget. We quickly forget. Do you know, it was only weeks before that God held back the Jordan. Now, the Jordan was in flood. And he held it back so that approximately two million people could go across on dry ground. And it was, it was recorded. In fact, if we go back to chapter 2, and I think it's, I got it in verse 9. This is, remember the spies that went in to see Jericho and they went to the house of Rahab? Now this is what, this is what Rahab says. 
Um, now, before they lay down on the roof, that's the spies, uh, she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, who you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in heaven, above, and on earth beneath. Now they'd heard about the Red Sea. Now then, we go to uh, chapter 5, the beginning of chapter 5. And it says, So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until they had crossed over, that their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. They'd heard of what happened at the Red Sea, and they'd heard of what happened on the Jordan. And now, they seem to have forgotten about what God had done. But don't we do the same? Don't we do the same? God comes in for us, possibly supplies for us, heals us, touches us, um, leads us in a certain way. And then when we come to the next problem, what am I going to do? What am I going to do now? How do I get out of this? How do I work my way through this? And we've forgotten about what God has already done. You know, well, like, like Joshua, we are not going to face our Jericho alone. He thought he was on his own, there, wondering, pondering, looking at, at these walls. But let's read those few verses again in, in chapter 5, verse 13. It came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, it doesn't say that he was with the people, he seems to be by himself that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? <coughs> so he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. You know, when it comes to God turning up, there seem, he seems to follow one rule. And that is, there is no rule. He turns up as he wants, when he likes, in whatever appearance he wants to be. Remember Abraham? who was sitting in his tent, and three people were coming to his tent. Two of them was angels, one of them was the Lord. They were travellers. They were travellers. And they sat with, with, uh, with, with Abraham, and they, they, Abraham prepared a, a, a meal for them. And they sat there and ate with them, and the two angels went on to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, of course, the Lord gave the promise to, to uh, Abraham and to Sarah that this time next year, Sarah will have a baby. Wow. One nearly 90 and one. 80. Yeah, great. He came as a traveller. Now then, Moses. How did he appear to Moses? You'd never think that one out, would no, you? No. He appears in a burning bush. You don't see that happening. No. Who would have thought of that? He appears and he turns up as he wants. Balaam. How does he turn up to Balaam? In a donkey. And the donkey speaks to him. Oh, you don't see that every day, do you? You won't see that on Porthgold Beach. A donkey talking to you. But the donkey, the Lord speaks to Balaam through the donkey. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in, in, um, with Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon being thrown into the fiery furnace. What does Nebuchadnezzar say? Didn't we throw three people in there? 
But there's a fourth, and he's like the son of God. Now, how he knew that, we don't know. But those are the words that he used in the garden tomb after the, after the resurrection. And Mary is there. How does he appear to her? Are you the gardener? And it's only when he says her name. His appearance was, he appears as he wants. When you're on the road to Emmaus with these two men. He appears as a traveller. And he's walking with them and he's talking with them. And he's opening their minds and their hearts to the scripture. On the shores of Galilee, just after the resurrection, where he was going to meet his, his disciples. He shouts out to them, have you caught anything? Have you any meat? He says, have you got anything to eat? And they thought he was a fisherman. He appears as he wants, and here he appears as a man with his sword in his armour, with his sword drawn. Who was he? Who was he? Well, he was definitely flesh and bone. It's one of those uh, pre-Bethlehem appearances of the Lord Jesus. Turns up, and here he is standing now with... Uh, uh, with, with Joshua, he definitely wasn't an angel. Definitely wasn't an angel because where have you heard those words before? Take your sandal off your feet, because the place you stand is holy ground. Where was that, Moses? Isn't it by the burning bush with the presence of God? So it definitely wasn't an angel. And Joshua worshipped, and in Revelation, you know, you you don't worship. The angel said to John, "Don't worship me." Worship God. They do not accept worship. There is only one angel who will accept worship. And that's Lucifer himself. He, he desires your worship, my worship, and the worship of, of men and women around. He desires that worship. But this was a, a, a pre-incarnate, uh, pre-Bethlehem, we'll call it, appearance of, of the Lord Jesus Christ to, uh, to Joshua. It's difficult sometimes, isn't it, to think of Jesus before Bethlehem. Because we just think that's the first time that he's come into this world, but he wasn't. There were many times in the, in the, in the Old Testament where, where Jesus turns up different forms, different ways. But he's there. But he's the one who the Bible tells us is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he'll be exactly the same. And the normal restrictions of time and of place do not appear or apply to him, I should say. They don't apply to him. It, it, it's, it's wrong of us to try to limit the work of the Lord Jesus down to 33 years that we read about in the, in the Gospels because he's been at work right through the, the whole canon of Scripture. You see, he stood by here with Joshua outside Jericho. <laughs> And he stood there long before, as he, as he was talking to, to, to Joshua outside Jericho, he stood there long before he ate a meal with Zacchaeus inside Jericho. But he'd been there before. He'd already been there before. And now he sat in, with Zacchaeus inside. And here he's sharing a moment outside with Joshua. I am commander, he says, of the armies of the Lord. But well, there's only two armies here, isn't there? There's Joshua's army, and there's Jericho's army, the Canaanite's army. Not so, there's three. There's another army, the Lord's army. He's the commander. Jesus declares that he is the, the, the commander of the Lord's army. The human eye just saw two, but there were three. Do you remember Elisha's situation? You remember his servant? Um, we'll assume his name is Gehazi because that was his servant later, late, later on. They say he's Gehazi and you read it in 2 Kings chapter 6. The Syrians were like locusts in the valley and Elisha was there and the army of Israel was there. Nothing in comparison to what they saw in front of them. And Elisha's servant said, Master, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? We, we, we're totally, totally outnumbered. And Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, will you open his eyes? 
eyes that he may see. And it says in, in verse 17, And the Lord opened his eyes, and the servant could see that the mountain was filled with fiery chariots. And he said, Behold the armies of the Lord and of our God. And they were surrounding the whole of Israel. How many angels are there? You think of these armies, how many angels? Well, you go into Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. John's looking in there and he says, I saw, this is just before the throne now, the throne of God. He said, I saw angels 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. How much is 10,000 times 10,000? 100 million. 100 million. 10,000 times 10,000. A hundred million plus thousands upon thousands of angels before the throne. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews that all these angels are ministering spirits to those who are the heirs or the ones who have received salvation. They're there for you and for me if we know the Lord Jesus for ourselves. You remember, the, have you read the book by Billy Graham, Angels? Yeah. The book called Angels. Well, in there he calls them God's secret agents. That they work. They work amongst us. They work for us. He sends them in. Because here he says, Jesus is the commander of them all. He's the commander of the army filled with angels. And you and I will never face our Jericho alone. Never will face it alone. The commander will come to you and me somehow, somewhere, in some form, to reassure you and me that I'm with you. I'm there with you. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. As he says in, in Hebrews 13 verse 5, you will never give up on you. He will always be there for you. Hold on to that. Hold on to that. That he is there with you as you face your Jericho. But we've got to do what Joshua did. Joshua, first of all, the scripture tells us there, <coughs> he lifted up his eyes. Now it could be that his head had sagged with the task in front of him. With what was going, going to what was going to take place. He didn't know how he was going to get around this. But he found the answer to what was in, in front of him when he lifted up his eyes and he saw. He saw this man, this person, this one who had come down specifically for him. To speak to him and to tell him how it was all going to play out. How it was going to happen. Not a sword was going to be lifted until they got into the city. <coughs> They were going to march around. The, 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 the instructions were given as to do this and this will happen. March around it once a day six, for, for six days. And on the seventh day, march around the seventh day. Blow the trumpets. Great shout. And the walls will fall down flat. And then the swords were lifted when they got inside the city. It doesn't record here that he prayed. Didn't, didn't read that, did we? But it did tell us that he worshipped. He worshipped. He lifted his eyes and he worshipped. Because God knows. Do you know sometimes you can't pray, can you? It's just you don't know what to say. You don't know where to start. But God knows your heart. He knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And all we have to do is just lift our eyes to him and open our hearts to him. What the psalmist say, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. <clears throat> Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. You see, we can, we can become so easily absorbed with Jericho. We can be absorbed with it and we, we just can't get it out of our minds and out of our sight. And, we, and that we forget this, that what we have to do is look to him. Lift our eyes to him. Because he's the one that's going to, to help us. 
Remember the things, the miracles that God has done in your life. Remember the times that he's stepped in for you. And he's not changed. He's the same. He's exactly the same as when he, 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 he um, helped you or whatever he did for you that time. He hasn't changed since then. Don't believe the lies of Satan. He will try to tell you things. Well, you know, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It happened. Like, don't believe the lies of, of Satan. He uses men and women as well. And unfortunately, he uses Christians as well to say things to you that will drag you down and take your faith away from the Lord Jesus Christ. And your eyes are diverted from those things then. The commander Jesus will always turn up for you in one form or another. Or he'll send an angel, which he has done. Elijah again, in chapter 9, perhaps... I don't know whether you've ever been in Elijah's place, but Elijah had come to the end of himself. And in chapter 9, it says this about Elijah, and Elijah lay down and he begged the Lord, take my life from me. Take my life away. I've had enough. He, is, he was convinced that he was the only one that was left in the country that was following God. And a whole country had had literally abandoned God and were worshipping Baal. And he was convinced he was the only one. And he just lay down to go to sleep and begged God to take his life away. You read it in, in chapter 9 of 1 Kings. And then somebody appeared there. I don't know how long he'd been sleeping, but he gave him a tap on his shoulder and he woke up and it says an angel had appeared to him. Now, in what form? It doesn't say that he had white wings and a halo, but he was there. And there was a fire, and there was a, there was a, a, a jar of water, and there was a cake being cooked on the fire. And he said to, to uh, Elijah, eat and drink, for the journey ahead of you is great. And the Bible tells us that he ate the cake. That would have been angel cake. <laughs> <laughs> so he ate his angel cake <laughs> and he drank the water and this Bible tells us he went on the strength of that meal for 40 days and 40 nights and God revealed to him as he spoke to him he said there are Elijah you are not alone there are 7,000 who I have reserved who have not bowed the knee to Baal he was not alone God was with him all the time but he wanted to reassure him there were 7,000 other people as well that were in the same position as he was. God will come. Help will come in some way, in some form. Now let me, let me finish those two stories before we finish it. It's a bad thing, and then when you come into the end of the, of the message, and then you take your watch off. <laughs> uh, the first one was uh, Joy Vernon. Now, we left her there in, in the hospital bed um, with her thoughts that you might as well take my life because I just can't handle this. Well, the door opened and the doctor came in and she was lying, lying, lying in the bed looking at this man and she hadn't seen this doctor before. There was something just not weird, strange, whatever you want to call it. He had a... He had a his hair back and he was in a bit of a ponytail and he just went to the hen, hen, hen. he went to the end of the bed and he picked up the, uh, the the clipboard you know with her notes on and she said he stood there looking at the, the clipboard and she said as I looked at him I knew he wasn't reading it he was just looking at it and she said then he looked at me and she said there's one thing which I, I told everyone else, and I will never ever forget his eyes. He said, she said, they were sky blue. Sky blue. And she said, he just looked at me, and he said, you'll be all right. You'll get through this. And he left. And then her, his, 
who husband, I should say, came into the room a few minutes later, and uh, she said, the doctor just came in here and said that I'm going to be okay. He said, what doctor? And she described the fella, so he went out to reception, and they said, we haven't got a doctor here, anything like that. So they, they went into the room, some other doctors went in the room, and they were speaking to Joy, and she was saying, well, he definitely came in here, and he spoke to me. You know, he just told me that everything's going to be okay. Right. And you don't know his name. He didn't, no, he didn't have a badge on or anything like that. He just said that. Well, they went out now, and they went to the recording room because there's CCTV cameras. Well, they saw this man walking down through the corridor with a ponytail, a little small ponytail, going into the, into the, the private ward. The CCTV camera was still rolling outside. They saw the door open, but nobody came out. And all you can say is that God sent an angel. Joy Vernon is still in a wheelchair, but she's very active. And she's active in the church in San Antonio. She got through it. She, okay, okay, it's not one of those stories where... You know, you come out and, and everything is fine. The back is not broken or anything like that. But he brought her through it when she felt that she, she wanted to end her life. She wanted to take everything away. And she's still active today. And, of course, the second one is the Sunday school teacher. She's in bed. <coughs> I, I, I'm sure I, I told you this story before about Charles Stan, uh, this lady in Charles Stanley's church. Or oh, I might have said it somewhere else. But... <coughs> She was, she was in bed, she was, she was having this, this, the, the medication intravenously going into her. <coughs> there was a, they were living in a cul-de-sac in a little town in America. And uh, there was a knock at the door and her husband went to the door and there was a man standing there. And he said, I've come about your wife. And he was in a suit. And the husband said in, in his testimony, I don't let people just walk into my house. You know, he said, that's not me. But he said, I just sort of looked at this man and I stood to one side and he went in. And he went into the room downstairs where his wife was in, in bed. And he said, it must have been 30 seconds, if that. But this man was walking back out and he said to me, everything's going to be okay. And he said, I, I just shut the door. <laughs> and then I, he said, when I, I sort of gathered my thoughts and I thought, what's going on with you? And he said, I went out. And I looked out in the street, it was only our car in the street, he said, there was no sign of anybody outside. No, no way. And then he said, my wife was calling for me. And he said, she, she was unconscious. So he said, I went into the room and she's sitting now. She's not lying in the bed. She's sitting on the edge of the bed. And he said, what, what's going on? What's happening? And she said, well, I, as far as I know, I was out. And she said, I happened to hear the door opening and someone walked into the room. I felt a touch on my hand and a fire going through me and the words, everything's going to be all right. And she said, that's all I remember. I never saw who it was. I don't know who it was. And he was trying then to describe to her what this man looked like. And you know, strangely enough, he couldn't describe him. He said, I can't remember what he actually looked like. So anyway, they got in touch with the hospital uh, to, to, to say that, you know, my wife's sitting up in bed and, and uh, everything, you know, I don't know what's going on. So they took her into hospital. They did a full body scan on her. <clears throat> there was no sign of any cancer anywhere. Gone. They could not believe what they were saying. And all that they can say is that God sent his angel for that lady. And she, she carried on with her Sunday school work. I don't know if she's still alive today, but facing the Jericho, God will turn up in some form or another. He'll be there for you and for me. It's lovely to hear those words, aren't it? It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And it's going to be okay when he turns up it could still be a battle. He was still going to have a battle with Jericho. But he knew that God and the armies of God were going to be with them. 
was going to fight for them and that they were actually going to win because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ told them there. Jericho may be strong, you were Jericho may be big, but our God is bigger Amen. and he's stronger Amen. and the walls of that Jericho will fall down. Amen. Let's trust him, is it? Let's trust him.